Hey everyone, I'm Laura. Welcome back to Deep Dive into Yoga. In this section of the PDF that we're working with, and if you haven't downloaded it yet, you can go over to lauragyoga.com. When you sign up for my newsletter, you're going to get the PDF sent directly to you as soon as you sign up, if you want to follow along. But in this video, we're going to be looking at different types of posture practice because I've seen people really get stuck in one particular form of practice, especially early on, and I feel like they're missing out on the wider world of yoga and how you can pick and choose different elements of your practice that are going to help you to work on different things within your life, different things within your body, different things within your energetic system. So for you to really get a better idea of the holistic view of yoga, you want to go out and see what some of these different practices are about. It's going to be an eye-opening experience. The first one that I put on the list here is the one that a lot of people in the Western world are introduced to first. And really, um, globally, I feel like vinyasa is the practice that is probably the most dominant in terms of posture practice. And vinyasa basically means linking breath and movement. So there's more of a continuous flow of the poses. The teacher works very hard to think of the sequencing that the poses are going to have so that they flow together really nicely and the transitions are smooth. I know I came to practice vinyasa and then I went to a, I started attending a class at a Hindu temple regularly and the practice was very different. It was, you did a pose, you stopped doing that pose, you went into another pose, you held that pose for a period of time, you finished that pose, you went into a new pose. They weren't linked together, you weren't flowing and repeating the poses over and over. So when I first did that more traditional version of practice, it was quite different for me. Um, and it took a little while for me to really understand like, oh, there isn't just one way to practice, right? Because when I was a new student, that one way that I had been exposed to, I thought that was how you practiced yoga and that was kind of it. So this is really about opening your eyes earlier on, hopefully uh, sooner than it took me to figure these things out. <laughs> hopefully I can give you a little jump start. The next one is yin and Yin is one of those words in yoga that can be a little bit confusing. So I mentioned before how certain words are kind of used to mean two different things. Yin is a type of energy. Yin is the feminine, lunar, soft, malleable type of energy. The opposite of that would be yang or yin, yang energy. Sometimes people say yang, sometimes they say yang. So yin and yang, or yin and yang. But yin is the softer version of that, the receptive version of that. And the practice that traditionally is called yin is where you hold a certain pose. It's a lot of floor work because you need support. And you're holding the pose for, I'll say like anywhere from three to five minutes. So it's a very deep, intense stretch. If you looked at the person in the pose from the outside, it really wouldn't look like much was going on. They're just holding this pose for a, a pretty long duration. But internally, it's one of the most challenging practices that I have done and also one of the most rewarding because you have so much time with very intense sensation within your body and so much time to really address the inner workings of your mind. So whatever patterns start to come up, you have that space to watch them unfold and address them if you need to. A lot of times I will use a mantra when I'm doing yin practice so that my very busy vata mind does not start to think about everything <laughs> except for yoga. Um, I like to give myself an anchor. So a lot of times when I'm in a yin pose for that three to five minute period, I will practice a mantra or I will anchor myself to my breath where I'm just very carefully watching the inhale and the exhale or any number of other anchors or points of focus that you can use. But yin is very much about letting go, releasing, working through very deep tension in your body. 
There's a lot of hip opening work, a lot of really deep shoulder opening work, which is great for a lot of people who sit um, or particularly athletes who do a lot of really heavy strength, strength training. So very yang type of movement, they can balance that out with a yin practice where they get to practice being still, practice working on their internal mental health, the processes of their mind, but also get that really deep sustained stretching. So yin is a wonderful practice. The next type of practice is restorative and restorative holds a special place in my heart. It is one of my absolute favorite practices. It also kind of falls in that category of yin energy because it is soft. It's more toward the lunar uh, feminine side, but it is practiced differently when we're talking about this in terms of asana practice. Restorative practice, if I saw that on the schedule, I would think, okay, we're going to be using a lot of props and you're actually trying to make yourself as comfortable as possible. It's similar to yin practice and the fact that you're holding your poses for, um, I would say even longer usually. So maybe between five and eight minutes, but doing a pose for like 10 or 15 minutes would not be unheard of, especially toward the end when you're trying to get really deep relaxation. But I did a, a restorative training with Cindy Lee and she talked about how the process that you're going through in restorative yoga is actually using the props and putting your body into this space of sensationlessness, meaning without sensation. It's almost like a form of sensory deprivation, or you could think of it as like pratyahara, where you are drawing yourself away from the external senses and going into your internal environment. When you're in a restorative pose, you're reaching this place of complete support with all the props around your body. You're usually going to have your eyes closed, maybe have an eye mask over your face, and you have all of this focus on slowing your breath and peeling away the layers of tension that exist in your body. I remember when I was at Yogaville doing my month-long residential program, there were a few optional things on the schedule and if you had time to fit in an extra afternoon practice, there was a restorative class. And there was almost always a line of people out the door because they only had enough props for, I think it was like maybe eight people. So there was always a waiting list of like, oh, did somebody not show up? Okay, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll jump in and grab their spot because that's how much we loved the restorative practice. It was just amazing. So if you ever get the chance to do a restorative workshop or hopefully your studio has a regular restorative class on the schedule, definitely try it. All right, so the next one is Kundalini Yoga. And this probably looks the most different from the other types of posture practice that we're going to be talking about today. And I love Kundalini. I did my teacher training just to specialize in Kundalini about a year and a half ago. And Kundalini is a very energetically based practice. And because of that, it looks very different. There's a lot of strong breath work. There are these movement sets that are used to cleanse your energy. So there's specific sets of movements that are pre-written and you practice them for different therapeutic effects. There are ones to help you to break habits. There are things to help you to shift your energy toward being more positive, um, to support prosperity in your life. There's so many different kriyas, that's what the movement sets are called, that you can use to have a specific energetic effect in your life. But if you are looking for something to try that looks very different from vinyasa practice, look into kundalini yoga. I have, as of right now, I have two courses that I teach on kundalini yoga. If you go on my website, the first one is free and that's just to help people get introduced to this because it is so different. I think sometimes people shy away from it, but don't shy away from it. It is a wonderful practice. So check out kundalini yoga. Usually if you see people wearing white when they are practicing yoga, most of the time they are kundalini practitioners. Okay, Iyengar yoga. So this goes back into a specific lineage, BKS Iyengar, and he's definitely one of the big names in terms of modern yoga. 
So Iyengar's main claim to fame, he wrote a ton of books and um, his children wrote several books. So there's really a very strong lineage there. But Iyengar was really the person that I see as starting to bring props into yoga and to angle it really strongly toward therapeutic practice. So I have a book about Iyengar yoga for scoliosis and it talks about using all different props uh, to help to lengthen the spine and working on correcting the curvature from scoliosis. Lots and lots of props, all sorts of different tools that you are using within that practice. And because I teach yoga therapy for people who usually have an injury, a condition, um, some sort of health concern, props are amazingly helpful in adapting the practice so that any person, any physical ability can get access to doing the yoga poses. So thank you to Iyengar for that. And if you want to get really detailed into alignment, Iyengar is the one to study. Uh, my original teacher was Iyengar trained, so that's why I use so many props. And I started out my teaching being very alignment based. And I think that that can have a, a very useful jumping off point, especially with beginners, because concrete rules can be so helpful to new teachers and to new students to say, okay, this is the way that I want you to start the practice. But I really feel like there needs to be an evolution after that where we allow the student more flexibility within their own practice to acknowledge individual variation and to say oh okay well that alignment works for that person but it doesn't feel good for me because my hip socket has a different shape to it so i have to do the pose a little bit differently so studying iyengar style can be so tremendously educational but just keep that in the back of your mind there is no one correct way for you to practice the poses because all of our bodies are slightly different. Okay, Kripalu yoga. So this is another specific lineage. And if you've heard Kripalu, you might be familiar with the retreat center up in Massachusetts. I've never been there. Um, my teacher, the studio that I taught at most recently was Kripalu trained and she would go every year to Kripalu for a retreat and to take continuing education classes. So. Kripalu is a beautiful style of yoga, and it is one of the ones that really tends to pull in some of the other limbs and has a, maybe a slightly more gentle approach to doing the poses than some, you know, power yoga or something like that. So Kripalu is a great lineage to look into. Ashtanga yoga is another specific lineage, and I mentioned earlier how there's that word again, Ashtanga gets used in two different ways. The word Ashtanga breaks down to mean eight limbs, the eight limbed path of yoga. But Ashtanga Vinyasa is the lineage of Patabi Joyce. And in Ashtanga practice, you can look up the primary series and the secondary series. There's actually a, a sheet with preset uh, list of poses that you do the primary series, the exact same poses in that sequence. And you'll have an entire room of people if they're doing group practice and they are doing the primary series together. And the teacher will walk around and give adjustments or, um, you know, give you little pointers if you need some assistance. But Ashtanga can be a very different looking practice. If you like routine, if you like structure, and you like boundaries, you will probably gravitate toward Ashtanga yoga because you will have that very set practice. I am the complete opposite of that. I love variety. I love change. I love adaptation. So I don't tend to gravitate toward Ashtanga yoga, but it's a great form of practice. Okay, and then I have a couple other kind of um, fun ones. So aerial yoga, I actually have an aerial yoga hammock. I had it installed in my house when I built my house. My builder thought I was a little crazy, but that's okay. It is a, a hammock of fabric that you use as a prop while you're doing different types of yoga practices. And my favorite version is to use the aerial yoga hammock for restorative yoga. So think like the relaxation of being in a hammock, which is one of my favorite things, 
but you are doing different yoga poses while you are suspended in this hammock or while you're holding on to it for support. It's amazing. Um, there are other forms of aerial yoga that are more acrobatic and definitely more athletic in nature where you are turning upside down and doing inversions. It's a great option if you want to experiment with inversions, but maybe you have something going on with your neck where turning your body upside down and going into headstand and putting your body weight onto your neck is not safe. You might want to talk to your healthcare team about suspension, um, unweighted suspension. So aerial yoga, you can use the hammock to turn your body upside down use gravity to create traction within your spine, which is very often a therapeutic thing to create space so that the nerves have more room to exit the spine. Um, it can help with things like pinched nerves, but the aerial yoga hammock can be a great thing to do things like inversions or to do things like um, restorative practice. So such an amazing prop, but definitely a very modern addition to the landscape of yoga. Okay, the next one is pre and postnatal yoga. There's so much going on in your body when you are pregnant or when you are postpartum. And yoga is such a great way to get in touch with your body, to notice the subtle cues that your body is giving you, to watch how your body is adapting and healing from that process of giving birth. And it's a great way to take care of yourself when you're a new mom. They also have like mommy and me classes where you can work on getting some relaxation, moving your body around, bonding with your baby, creating that stronger connection. And when you as a new mother are more relaxed and more regulated, the baby's nervous system is going to pick up on that. So I see yoga as such a, such a vital tool for women when they are going through that process of pregnancy, birth, postpartum, um, and probably well into child rearing. They also have partner classes where you can attend with your partner and they can kind of help you through different poses. You can use that as a bonding experience between the two of you. Um, it's so many different options on how yoga can really enhance that process of being a parent. All right, and then the last one is hot yoga. And I like to do my own version of hot yoga in the summer. When it is 90 degrees and above, I will be outside with my yoga mat, doing my practice, happy as can be because I love being warm. I also love the way that my body feels different when I am warm. I feel like I can move so much better. Right now it's winter here, so it's kind of the opposite end of that. Winter has that effect, especially for me, of feeling more restricted, more drawn in. Um, so if I get the opportunity to practice in a a room that is heated or outside when it is hot. I love to notice the difference that has with my body. Um, the one thing I do like to, I'll just mention very briefly, I'm not going to go into detail with it here, but I didn't put Bikram on here specifically because Bikram is a, is a lineage. Um, Bikram Chodroy was a, or is a teacher who brought this whole idea of hot yoga. He had his specific, I think it was 28 poses where he kind of copy wrote, copy wrote that sequence and it was always taught the same way. He had many, many studios, right? So big lineage. And he was found to have perpetrated all sorts of abuse through his teachings with his students and he's actually i think currently banned from coming into the u.s or he will get arrested i don't know where he is but i made the decision not to practice in that lineage because anytime i went to a bikram studio that money would eventually be going back toward him and i don't want that to happen you can go online and search bikram yoga controversies and there is a documentary that talks about the whole situation. Um, I have a little bit more information about that in the next text. I'm not quite done writing it yet, but the next ebook is going to be called Light and Shadow in Yoga, where I talk about 
some of the controversies and how I have worked through different challenges within the landscape of yoga. And that is definitely one of them when I came to realize what was happening in that lineage. So there are forms of hot yoga that are not specifically Bikram. So just be mindful of that. Make your choices. Decide where you want your energy and your money to go toward. <laughs>